Hello, everybody. Just a, a few words about myself first. Um, I currently am not in consultancy directly. I'm a, an account director for a cloud software vendor called Blackline. I spend my time looking after 50 Nordics clients. So when I'm dealing with contracts and commercial uh, topics, uh, amongst other things, every day. Um, uh, we sell software and consulting services, so it, it's still re relevant to this to conversation. Um, just a, a brief, so I, I met Simon Yu quite a long time ago now uh, at KPMG Consulting, um, where I was in the uh, office of the CFO, as oh, that's what we term it today, it wasn't called it then, but uh, uh, CFO services, basically. Um, I then spent some time independently consulting. Um, and then I went back into uh, a more niche uh, outsourcing advisory firm. I'm an accountant by background and uh, before KPMG spent a few years traveling globally in finance roles. So uh, happy to be here today to share what I can about commercial topics. Um, it's first, uh, probably worth just reflecting on the different kinds of consultant that you might be. Uh, you could be an employee in a firm like KPMG uh, or many others. You could be a freelance consultant. You could work with uh, as, as an associate, uh, not a full-time employee of a, uh, a larger firm. Uh, you could work for a company like ours on the uh, consultancy side. Um, so, so as you can see, different kinds of models of working. Um, just on what, what's the best one to do? Well, it, it's really up to you. Uh, there are advantages of being employed. There are advantages of being a freelance um, as an employed consultant, you probably, in, certainly in the early parts of your career, have less uh, responsibilities around the contracting and commercial aspects of consulting. Um, as you go up through the ranks, you'll very much be selling, as we just heard, and uh, contracting and developing statements of work and ensuring that risks are managed and that you're going to get paid. So uh, very much becomes your responsibility. Um, if you're freelance, uh, you really do have a lot of responsibility for all the commercial things uh, from, uh, from an early stage. So uh, it's really depends on how you're working. Um, so you really need to um, reduce the level of effort or, or should I say, have the level of effort you spend on non-revenue generating activities, uh, keep, keep it proportional. Um, so you really need to qualify the opportunities that you work on uh, do you uh, understand the client's requirements? Um, is it something that you want to do? As Colin was uh, saying, do you want to do it? Is, is it what you're good at? I, is it your sweet spot? And uh, have you got the track record in that particular uh, service? Um, perhaps you've got some particular resources or have developed a methodology uh, where you can uh, demonstrate credibility and capability. Um, are you likely to win? It's always uh, best to work with people who've hired you before because if, if they've worked with you before, you're more likely to be successful than if you're it's a new relationship and other people have a stronger relationship than yourself. Um, it's 
really important to quantify the effort um, that you're uh, proposing um, within uh, reasonable tolerance so that you can put that statement of work together and be confident that you can deliver what you're going to deliver as you specified. Uh, but you also need to be thinking about the risks that you're taking on and whether you can mitigate those in your uh, contractual paperwork. Um, in particular, specify the assumptions. For example, uh, what you're expecting from the client, what resources that you're expecting from the client, what you're expecting the client to do. A personal example of when I was working independently, I was uh, brought in to uh, manage a program uh, to select a BPO provider. And I was under the uh, assumption that uh, the, there would be a team of client resources. So if I was doing this piece of work in KPMG, I'd probably have a team of three to five people to try and achieve what I was going to achieve. Um, the client did uh, provide resources, but those resource, resources were uh, very willing to advise me, but they were very uh, unwilling to actually do anything. So uh, actually, I was left with quite an enormous task to try and deliver um, uh, this, this piece of work with very little actually uh, sleeves all rolled up effort from the client. So it was a very big learning point for me in the early days of my independent career. Um, okay. Um, this a uh, little bit crosses over into how to sell your work. Um, but I thought it's worth mentioning that to keep a lid on these uh, non-revenue generating tasks, make sure you have multiple channels uh, to, to uh, sell your work. The best channel is your own network. Um, and so it's really important to maintain your network. Um, your network can also include uh, other consultants who also are marketing and have their network. So if you collaborate, then you are much more able to find work uh, and also pull together teams of uh, complementary skills so you can sell interesting pieces of work with trusted colleagues, trusted contacts. Um, my current work with Blackline, an American software company, has taught me the uh, uh, benefits of social selling. So LinkedIn can be an enormously good resource, um, for example. Um, you can obviously work with uh, agencies and niche consultancies um, where you can uh, sell your complementary skills. Um, when you're uh, qualifying the piece of work, it's a good idea to use some kind of uh, formalised process to, to document it, how you're qualifying an opportunity. It's, it's a best practice if you can get into the habit of that. And, and that's an example there, Miller, Miller Hyman's blue sheet. Um, So what about charging for your services? Uh, we had a question earlier about pricing. So maybe we could pick up that discussion here as well. Um, there are different pricing models, of course, um, time and materials, so, so day, day rate kind of pricing, fixed fee where you may quantify how much it would cost to deliver a particular phase of a project, for example, or a, a particular report, as Simon was mentioning. mentioning. Um, uh, there may be some kind of uh, contingency 
type fee is if you achieve this, you by a certain date, you may uh, be paid a certain uh, contingency fee, for example. Um, so, so quite a different um, variety of ways that you can price. Um, it pricing, as as was mentioned before, what is it? What is it that you're selling? Is it something that's very new? For example, um, one of my ex KPMG colleagues has set up a consultancy around blockchain. So, for example, for the you know those, those skills are, are probably quite rare at this stage and hence higher value than something that's quite commodity particularly uh, say say around the type of work that I've been doing in the past outsourcing it's very commodity there's a lot of people who can do outsourcing work these days um, it could depend on the length of engagement you might um if it's a short, sharp, very strategic piece of work, then it may attract a different pricing to uh, a long delivery program, for example. Um, don't forget to charge and build in your expenses. Make sure there's a contractual term for that, how you're charging it. Um, and make sure you have some contingency for your holidays, uh, the, the other non-chargeable aspects of your working life. Uh, so don't be afraid to charge a premium uh, over an employment rate, for example, because if, if you're working independently, you do have to cover these fees. Um, Contracts, um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, your contract must be fit for purpose. Um, in my current work, I have uh, contracts which are, uh, well, we have a specific contract for our services, uh, but quite often clients want to use their contract and quite often they put a contract in front of us which is for traditional perpetual license uh, software and it's not fit for purpose for a cloud software so I have to politely ask them to use our template so try to have a standard template which are, is uh, suitable for your services uh, make sure it has all the relevant clauses in it uh, make sure it uh, mitigates uh, your risks um, make sure it's, uh, you know, it needs to be balanced. Obviously, the client won't accept something which uh, is, not, is not a balanced contract. So uh, you should be able to get a good quality template to start any particular assignment with and, and tailor that as needed. And the most important thing is the statement of work, which really is specifying what your work is, uh, how it will be delivered, and all the assumptions that you have uh, surrounding that. Um, if you are working independently and, and not in a, an employed model, clearly you it is a business and you need all the uh, business activities that surround uh, delivering your consulting assignments. So you have to uh, do your accounts and compliance activities, make sure you provision for your taxes, your insurances, um, provide whatever infrastructure you need, and also uh, uh, the, the marketing and uh, advertising activity as well uh, is you probably need to invest 
some in that if you want to grow your business beyond a one-man band for sure um getting paid is clearly uh, important you do need to make sure that you know how you'll get paid make sure you know who needs to sign off your work do they need timesheets, for example, if you're on a time and materials contract? Uh, who is signing off the milestone? What's the governance around that? Is it um, done in a programme steering committee, for example? Uh, make, sure, make sure that you do understand how that will be done. Um, You might be required, as I was in one engagement, to upload your billing into um, what they call a contingent workforce solution, uh, which many of the large enterprises use these days to, uh, to work with uh, um, non-employed uh, uh, resource. So again, Make sure you're following their processes and do chase payment if they're late. So long as you've done everything that you've you set out to do according to the contract and that you're, you have it signed off, then your client should pay you in accordance with the contract. So uh, don't be afraid to chase the payment. Um, so this is an interesting question. Maybe you can throw this one over to, uh, uh, out to the floor. Uh, can you charge the same for four 10-hour days as, as five eight-hour days? <laughs> Anybody want to answer that one? Um, any more questions or any any questions at all? I didn't see any questions coming in from the uh, chat. Well, Stephanie, perhaps one for myself. Do you notice differences between the public and the private sector in in commerciality? That would be my well, my first question. My second question would be thinking about. The, the new normal, are you noticing or expecting anything to be different on commercial commerciality and consultancy as we come out of the uh, uh, COVID lockdowns and recessions? Um, public sector v private sector, I've, I've had a little uh, experience of the public sector in my independent consulting days. Um, Obviously, they, they have to follow the public sector procurement rules and processes. Um, actually, that's a good question. Has Brexit changed this? Because a lot of the rules, the OG rules, were driven by uh, European Union le legislation. Perhaps uh, anyone, someone uh, could ask uh, answer that question. I... Um, I, I always thought that was the only advantage I could think of for Brexit, that we didn't have to follow OGU and public sector procurement rules. But in, in reality, what's happened is that the government uses that to buy anything they want without any kind of due process whatsoever. So it wasn't actually a good idea after all. Um, my partner actually uh, works for the health service and um, they have some interesting uh, buying mechanisms so it, I, I think it very much depends on which department you're working with and, and what processes they're following um, and the second question was around um, sorry could you remind me of the second question yeah so it was a kind of speculative question around do you, looking forward do you think uh, commerciality in consultancy is changing uh, do you see do you see anything new uh, coming up as we come into the new normal? 
Um, as I, I work in the software industry now, so I'm not probably best placed to answer that. Colin, perhaps, do you have any thoughts on that? You're muted, Colin. I don't, because actually I shut my company down in February um, mm -hmm. with the intention of not taking responsibility for any more big projects. So I'm not sure how it's going to affect things. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a bit of a speculative question, but just, uh, see if you have <laughs> anything you could share with us. But um, we, we will find out in due course. There are a few questions that have come in, um, some of which I don't fully understand. So. Enrico, you you want you've got a question on escrow. Do you want to uh, mm. unmute yourself and ask the question? Because if I try and interpret it, I'll mess it up. Enrico, will that be okay? Uh, hello. Uh, good evening uh, or good afternoon, uh, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to check with you because uh, I have seen like uh, a group. I uh, mean, most of the people now since uh, before even COVID. There's a lot of um, how do you say this freelancers doing co consultancy, and they are using uh, platforms, online platforms for this kind of uh, service. So most of those platforms are kind of like doing also an escrow service. So my question to Steph, to Miss Stephanie, is that uh, is it uh, a good start for for us or for someone to use an escrow? Uh, you, if one party or for example a client or even the consultancy provider is new to this trade thank you um it's it's not something that i've used personally so um i'm not really best placed to answer that one either i'm afraid <laughs> um anybody else had experience of that or I got peripherally involved in something that did need escrow, but it was very much around putting source code into a safe place in case the original provider lost it or something bad happened to the original provider. Mm, yeah, that's, that's my understanding of an application of escrow, yes. I, I haven't come across it in another way. You know, it's really in case the original provider disappears or the original source code disappears, that there is some recourse to being able to get access to those materials if, if all else fails. It's, it's something you often see coming up in risk registers and then reflected in contracts that that should happen. Um, I think the chances of you finding it's a lifeline should your software supplier um, cease to exist as um, Maybe a different question altogether. Having the source code probably won't actually solve the problem for you. I see um, uh, Simon M asking a question about uh, whether people are put off by IR35. I think that's probably out of out of your s scope as well, Steph. <laughs> uh, well, I know a bit, a bit about IR35. Um, are people put off by it? I mean, I think there's some quite clear um, tests about whether you are IR35 compliant or not. Certainly with, when I was independently consulting, um, I didn't have too much trouble uh, having IR35 compliant contracts. I think who are put off these days are uh, some large employers who have taken a policy decision that they're not taking any risks on IR35. So, for example, I have friends who worked in banking sector and anyone on any kind of longish term contract was put on employment contract. Yeah. Um, because the, the difference now is that the risk is on the side of the, um, of the client and if there are any uh, investigations and uh, any uh, um, non-compliance issues, then it is their risk, not the consultant's risk. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I, I see I, one last question, I think, um, 
I'd like to slightly modify from Rachel. Um, mm. And um, she's asking um, what your top three tips are for aspiring consultants. I think ra rather than ask Steph for her top three tips for uh, um, aspiring consultants, I think we ought to try and do one each. So um, uh, we've got Colin, Steph, Al, and myself. Um, one, one tip, and it's got to be a different tip each time for aspiring consultants. Let's go in, in running order. Colin, your top tip for an aspiring consultant. Write stuff down and be accurate. <laughs> okay, I think mine is work out where you're going to find a client, particularly if you're new in the game. Um, how do you actually find a client, uh, Steph? Yeah, I think try and try and work with some great inspirational people, whether that be cl uh, clients or other consultants. Um, yeah, cre create a, su a success which you can build on. Um, I think if just to give a personal example there is uh, when I joined KPMG Consulting, uh, as I said, I was working in um, finance consulting and I found a great project with a great team in the early days really of shared services. So it's sort of breaking new ground. And that really set me up for my consulting career. And, you know, I still use a lot of the learnings from that program today, even now. So if you start well, it never goes away. Alan. Yes. <laughs> well, you're my, my, my tip. Your top tip. Yeah. My, my top tip would be... Um, to be unique and try and be world class, and then everything else will follow. Oh. excellent! I, I will, I will try to improve my uniqueness in every way. See, it's it's easy when you get to my age; you can be wacky, and people just think it's uh, because you're getting old. <laughs> On which thought, uh, we should we should wrap up. Uh, we're uh, over time now, but uh, it's been a great talk and over. Uh, enjoyed listening to you, uh, the other speakers and 